Before I go into my topic, I would like to thank all those people who have been instrumental in enabling me to speak today, especially Mr. Prabhu and his team. Next, I would like to extend my warm regards to all the doctors present here. I know a few of you personally, but I am definitely looking forward to an opportunity to get to know all of you personally too. Over the next few minutes, I will be talking about the following. Overview of adolescent practice, my experiences and observations, and the background knowledge that is needed to deal with adolescents. Adolescent medicine is slowly but definitely evolving into a distinct speciality. As of now, we pediatricians and physicians are taking care of them, but whoever is the primary caretaker, problems in this age group are very unique, predominantly non-medical. Too much for pediatricians and physicians to handle, too little for psychiatrists and gynecologists to take over. So there is a general tendency to brush it off as age or hormone related, hoping it will settle with maturity. Parents too are helpless. They know that things are not okay with their adolescents, but they have no other choice but to keep their fingers crossed and pray for things to get better. In short, adolescent medicine is a no man's land and adolescents are nobody's property. Any speciality or subspeciality for that matter evolves out of necessity. As science advances, more and more problems get recognized, more and more diagnoses are made, more and more therapeutic options arise. Slowly, some people get oriented to these nuances either by chance or by choice. Others, who have already established in a particular way, continue to do what they usually did but utilize these services additionally. This is how age-based specialities like pediatrics, geriatrics, pediatrics, geriatrics and neonatology, and system-based specialities like cardiology, pulmonology, nephrology, etc. have evolved. Adolescent medicine is one such. It's an age-based speciality, but apart from the further unfolding of science, our changing culture has an important contribution towards the evolution of this speciality. In the West, it is already a well-established and accepted speciality. In India, it is just a fetus or maybe a newborn baby. We have a long way to go. Always we are more than 10 years behind the West. We generally don't tend to learn from their mistakes. We do mistakes in the same way as they did, and we learn the we learn lessons the same way as they did. Be it food, virginity, family life, or anything else. Right now in the West, they are propagating virginity cards in clubs, and we are teaching our adolescents how to use condoms. As far as adolescent medicine is concerned, the cultural changes that they went through several years ago, our adolescents are beginning to go through now. The need to help them that arose several years ago is already beginning to be felt here. We need to wake up before the damage is complete. We need to, for once, learn from their mistakes and work towards prevention rather than cure. But for this, we need more hands. We need more people to get oriented to adolescent health. Whatever is our speciality, orientation to adolescent health is possible if we have the interest, dedication, motivation and commitment, and of course, time. We can make life easy for them. When I began my adolescent practice, I was stunned by the problems that walked in. Not at all the ones I saw as a pediatrician. Very few were medical, many were gynecological. <coughs> but the major heartbreakers were psychological. Many of them amounting to clear-cut psychiatric diagnosis. 
All of them required psychiatric referral and they were of course referred by their primary physicians. But the parents decided not to take them there or they took them there and didn't follow the treatment. The reason being, they said, it is better to tolerate it and live with it rather than give a psychiatric label to their adolescents. For every problem, for example a myocardial infarction, for every diagnosis made, there must be a huge number suffering with its precursors like high BP, diabetes, cholesterolemia, etc. Similarly, for every diagnosis of a psychiatric disorder made during the adolescent age group, there should be a huge number with its precursors. And these precursors are behavior problems, difficult temperament, an unsupportive environment, particularly family. Where are these precursors? Where are these people suffering from the precursors? Are they suffering silently? Are we probably ignoring or missing illness? We need to probe, we need to pick up problems from the so-called well children and adolescents and help them. <coughs> the first step I thought would be to make a list of all the problems that they go through. Because only when we know what to expect, we know what questions to ask, what answers to get and how to do the needful help. It's something like the eyes do not see what the mind does not know. It's kind of based on that. So I did a lot of brainstorming, discussing, reading, referring, and also I did a lot, a, a short gross survey with a handful of adolescents and made a checklist of all their problems, both physical and mental. And also I made a checklist of their stresses and their stress busters. I'll share them with you all. Medical problems, the good news is that in this age group, medical problems aren't many. Apart from the usual URIs, LRIs, UTIs and fevers, etc., we need to keep the following in mind. Lifestyle related problems, which are activity, food and stress related. Most of our adolescents don't seem to have a clear idea about the concepts of good nutrition, hygiene and fitness. Metabolic syndrome particularly has to be kept in mind while we deal with this age group, which includes diabetes, hypertension, etc. Sports injuries. Adolescence is a period of rapid growth, but the musculoskeletal system wouldn't be mature yet. So they are particularly vulnerable to injuries related to sports or other injuries related to musculoskeletal system. Growth related. Again, there's the period of rapid growth. With the differential growth of the base of the skull, we expect problems with vision, dentition. Anemia, of course, is a universal problem. <coughs> Almost more than 90% of our adolescents are anemic. Puberty goiter has to be kept in mind. Age-related problems. For Although the presenting complaints are the same in different age groups, the causes, consequences, diagnosis and treatment differs for different age groups. The same is true for adolescent age group 2. So we need to have a checklist pertaining to every system what are the complaints that we should, what are the problems that we should think of in this age group. Sexuality related. Adolescents are physically and sexually mature. Mentally they are very impulsive. Nobody talks to them about sexuality the goodness and badness associated with it, the moral values associated with it. So they get information, half-baked information from their friends, from the media. Sexual experimentations are becoming very, very common in this age group. So we need to have sexually transmitted diseases, sexual abuse, pregnancy and even contraception in mind when, they, when we deal with this age group. Chronic illnesses like epilepsy, asthma, SLE, etc. These are like chronic immortal weeds which get stuck to us eternally. In this age group we expect flare-ups and at the same time we expect non-compliance with treatment and dropouts. But the major chunk of problem that I noticed in this age group are behavioral. Majority of them are egoistic, impulsive, snobbish, 
selfish, shy, arrogant, violent, what not. All of them score very low on socialization index. They have a very poor frustration tolerance. They, have, they are very weak on interpersonal skills. They have a very low self-esteem, a low self-confidence, and a very negative self-worth. Some of them are already into high-risk behavior, like substance abuse, sexual abuse. Some of them have suicidal tendencies. And a small but a significant number have already blown up into proper psychiatric disorders requiring treatment. Then I listed their stressors. These are the stresses that eat up our adolescents' brains. School, family, peers, all of them come with loads of ifs and buts. One needs to prove himself or herself to get accepted, acknowledged, hailed and honored. Others are rejected outright. No excuses, no compromises. Media too plays its role as a stressor perfectly. Aishwarya Rai syndrome, Hrithik Roshan syndrome, negative role models, anti-heroes, terrorism, sexual experimentation, and so on. Next I listed their stress busters. These are like vaccines. They kind of make them immune to all the stresses and they enable them to be socially and emotionally calm when they deal with themselves and with the outside world. Self-confidence and self-esteem are very important. They help them to stand apart in a crowd. They help them to counter the go-along to get-along attitude. This is needed today. Even if you have to be a good student, a good studier, you need to have self-confidence because you won't have a lot of people following behind you. They have to stand apart. Supportive family and trusted adults. They kind of make them feel that they're not alone. They guide them through their difficulties and stand by them at all times. Good friends. Good friends are like endorphins. They neutralize their pains instantly and relax them. Spirituality and positive attitude. They tell them that the best is yet to come. They give them a hope that the ending will always be good. So they help them to work harder and keep trying. Next. Role models and aim in life. They are like lighthouses. They drive them to their destination amidst all distractions and diversions. Life skills. Life skills include skills like problem solving, decision making, negotiating, coping with emotions, coping with stresses, interpersonal relationships, etc. These skills help them to clear their way in difficult situations. Moral values are absolute codes of conduct. They tell them what is right and what is wrong. I observed that all our adolescents are facing all the stresses and most of our adolescents are lacking most of them. Why is this happening to them? Unanimously, the blame was on parents. I observed that most of the parents are ill-equipped and miserable in parenting. They have no fixed style of parenting. They seem to know that all the past methods of parenting don't hold good anymore because the world is changing. But nobody seems to be clear as to what is the right method of parenting. The sprouting of old age homes and the almost extinct family, joint family systems are enough evidence to say that old people and their parenting styles have no takers today. Next. Parents themselves seem to be trying to keep pace with the changing world. They are no more the emotional pillars of support that they used to be. They are no more the storehouses of moral values that they used to be. In the name of love, they are pampering their children and weakening them. In the name of tolerance, they are nurturing their shortcomings and incorporating them into their personalities permanently. 